So, Alicia, we have a little slightly different format this week because you have a story to tell, yes? Welcome to Trashy Divorces, everybody. Yes. In this, a very special episode. A very special episode. Alicia's in charge. Yeah. Stacey, you had a slight mishap this week. Would you like to tell the people why Alicia's in charge this week of Trashy Divorces? Uh, Alicia is in charge this week on Trashy Divorces because Thursday I dislocated my shoulder and have been taking pain pills and have no access to my left arm at the moment and have not been able to. We were working on a different set of stories at the time. Totally different, which are coming to you probably next week. between the tramadol and the uh, immobilizer things that are wrapped around my body right now. You were a little incapacitated. I was not able to type the... Anyway, we'll be bringing those to you perhaps next week. You had a little incident with a cat and a stare. A and cat, a stare, some rain, some, uh, fun some slippage times in the ER. Elbow catching a wall, which I mean, saved me from probably landing on my head. But breaking that open could have been worse. Could have been, been worse. worse. That was extremely painful. I don't recommend it. So we're going to give a big shout out to oh, Shanita, are. your Shanita RN was emergency room nurse. Amazing bedside manner. Really, really appreciated her. And James, the x-ray Sweet tech. Sweet baby James was is super, our super favorite. Kind. He was super kind to you. And I think actually a new Trashy Divorces fan. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thanks, thanks for joining the family. Yes. Sweet baby James. Thank you rock. You. This week, because Alicia's in charge, I've been mm-hmm. waiting to do this story. I know you have. Me and Zelda Sarah Fitzgerald for a long time. Uh-huh, uh-huh. The Trashy Divorces of Ernest... Hemingway, four ah. wives. No, and the crowd goes. Uh. <laughs> uh, four wives, three divorces. Sweet, sweet Hadley, my very favorite. Pauline, snake in the grass. Martha Gellhorn, badass of all time. Last wife, Mary. It's a hella story this week that we are telling. It is that you did. Yes, you've you've locked this down. I'm. I'm- But before we get to that story, let's go ahead and talk about Patreon Patreon this week. We had a ton of people join us this week, which is amazing. We're going to do our magic mirror in a second for our Patreon people, new and existing. Guys, get ready. Next week is going to be double loaded. We had a bunch of stuff planned, written, ready to record at the end of last week where We spent some time in an ER instead of at the recording table. Mm -hmm. So Um, this week, mm -hmm. expect all kinds of crazy cool stuff on the Patreon. And y'all, if you are interested in hearing more or, hey, what else are we doing? We've got bonus divorces and our book club coming up and trashy tidbits and trashy tutors and fun with done. We have a ton of new people this week in the Magic Mirror who are learning all about The glory that is Patreon. Who's in our magic mirror? You want to start us? Thank you for joining us. Bonnie H., Chris K., Kate M., Uber Chic Polish, and Jody S. Keen B., I am keen on you, magnificent (laughs) supporter. Danielle D., Meg B., Olivia A., and Greta T. Mariel C., Jessica L., other Jessica. Again, two different Jessicas back to back. It's like the second week in a row that's happened. Yep. Lisa T, Alex D, Jennifer W, Linda G, Rachel S, Noel D, Linda L. And we have Joy W, KTC, Minty W, Abby R, and Laura N. Thank you all so much. I'm going to go ahead and maybe Lara N. Want to make sure we're covered both ways. Could be. Lara Laura, regardless, you fucking rock. Thanks for joining us on Patreon. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. We hope that you are finding some value there and some fun there. Also, one last thing before we start the ep, there are still a few tickets left uh, for yes. our live show at Vinkman's with our friend Erica Kelly from uh, Southern Fried True Crime. Sunday, August 25th here in Atlanta. Be sure that you check that out and get those because it's going to be a sellout and we want you there. Yep. Vinkman's.com or check out Trashy Divorces. There is a menu item for CS Live, I think. There you go. There you go. Are you ready for the 614 pound tuna catch that is the trashy divorces of Ernest Hemingway? I am. I am. Uh, and some more pain meds. <laughs> <laughs> go, go, go. Go, go, go. Let's do it. Hey, Alicia. So, Hi, uh, so you're taking one for the team this week and doing a long one because I am half of my torso is immobilized. 
It's going to be good. You're very kind to, to do that. Thank you. This is a story I've wanted to tell for a long time. Yeah, well, that I know. I'm good. So. I'm happy to take one for the team Okay. this week. I'm happy. Thank you for taking one for the team because... You got it. Mm. Welcome to my story oh. entitled mm-hmm. The Big Dick Energy of Ernest Hemingway. That Lizzo sure is working for you. If you like big dick energy, this is your guy. Four marriages in total, three divorces, four marriages. I've been waiting to do this story for a super long time. This is not a diminishment upon... Ernest Hemingway's writing, really good writer, good boxer, good outdoorsman, good fisherman, super masculine, maybe toxic masculine. Maybe. It's a pretty good cover for someone inside who is hurting incredibly, I think. I've had a lot of strong feelings about Hemingway for lots and lots of years. My feelings are pretty cemented and shared by my girl and fellow Leo, Zelda Sarah Fitzgerald. If you are interested in how Ernest affected the relationship of fuck off Scott Fitzgerald and Zelda, please roll on over to our Patreon page. There is an all access, totally free episode we loaded up on March 19th called The Love Triangle of Zelda and Scott and Ernest Hemingway. There's more background. If you want to know more about that, I'm going to steer away from it in this particular story. But I'm probably the Next person who feels in the world like Zelda about Ernest, full of bullfighting, bullslinging, and bullshit. I'm not a fan. Fan, Good good writer. This is, he is lousy to women. Lousy to women. (sighs) Tell me more. Hemingway has a good quote here. Every man's life ends in the same way. It is only the details of how he lived and how he died that distinguish one man from another. Today I'm going to tell you. How absolutely, utterly crappy Ernest Hemingway was to women. Okay. Great. Ernest. Hey, happy birthday, Ernest. This was a happy coincidence with me. Happy coincidence Just today. Just like hitting my shoulder on Thursday. Is uh, Ernest Hemingway's 120th birthday. Woo. He's a July 21st baby. Woo. Born the last day of the cancer sun signs. Does that make him cusp? Yeah. Okay. He technically is cusp. Remember, cancer is ruled by the moon. It's a water sign, naturally. And a cancer man's personality is full of contradictions. He was a cancer man. Soft, loving, considerate, nurturing to those he cares deeply for. But if you make a crab mad, oh, they are going to reveal their pinchers and protect themselves. He was a mad crab. He was a mad crab. Cancer men also tend to have very long memories and never forget once they have experienced a slight. Ernest is born the second child, but the oldest son. From birth until about the age of six, his mother dresses him like a girl and brings him up as a twin to his older sister. Six years apart, but he spends his life in girls' clothes. That that totally tracks with the hyper-masculine image I have of Ernest Hemingway in my mind. <laughs> it doesn't track at all doesn't track at all Mm -mm. his mother wanted uh, originally in her life to be an opera singer but apparently the lights were too harsh for her delicateness which is bullshit she wasn't delicate at all she teaches music but she tends to remind all of her family all the time that she could have been a star Mm. healthy healthy super healthy she marries ed hemingway who's a physician in oak park illinois He was also an avid outdoorsman. So two months out of the year, every summer, he goes off to northern Michigan, takes Ernest with him. And this is, by all accounts, Ernest's best time. He can dress as a boy. He fishes. He shoots. He gets to do boy things with his dad alone, where his mom, the other 10 months of the year, wants to make him a girl. There's no arguing with mom, though, because back in those other 10 months, like, she's kind of a bully. She's a bully to dad and to the kids. And even though dad is sort of harsh, mom is worse. Ernest is beaten a lot as a child. In the outdoors, he sometimes lines up a gun, lined up with his dad's head. He's got some some tendencies from a very young child. Yikes, yeah. But, I mean, never took the shot, so... Not yet. So he actually would whip himself so mama didn't have to. 
Okay, not sure what to say about that, really. No, bad. I mean, by all, mm-hmm. like, not a mm-hmm. great no. childhood at all. Mm-hmm. Weird. Yeah, okay. By high school, Ernest is, Ernest is very handsome. Okay. And he wants to be the center of attention. He's super well-liked, but he's super shy. Like, he's the kid who decorates for school dances, but leaves by himself before they start. He's not a great athlete. Which is weird because you think of him as such a mm, virile virile guy, but yeah. he joins the football team and he's not good at it, but he lies about being great at it. You're going to see this over and over. Whatever he's not good at, he just lies about and makes up. Huh. Where have I seen that hyper-masculine <laughs> trait before? He does start writing for the school paper and finds out that he really likes writing. He has found his passion and without... Any diminishment on how lousy he treats women, he is dedicated to the craft of writing for the rest of his life. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ernest's uncle is an editor at the Kansas City Star and lines up a job for Ernest, who gets uh, put on the crime beat. So, original murderino. True crime, yeah. He's a little shy, but he kind of starts to learn how to interview people. And the thing about the Kansas City Star is it has its own style book. And that style book emphasizes short sentences, strong words. So the best writing guide he could have ever had. Interesting. Yeah, it's like the Hemingway writing guide. Okay. He is rejected by the army because at this point, World War I, breaking out, he wants to join the war. But he's rejected by the army because of defective vision. So instead, he joins the Red Cross in 1918 in Italy. He's in the ambulance section. Wait, really? Mm-hmm. He, wow! I thought he was a soldier. Okay, go ahead. Oh, he lies and makes him out oh. himself out to be the best oh. soldier that ever soldiered. Oh, okay. He was the greatest soldier, the greatest soldier in the world in the biggest battles. That's in the best wars. That's kind of it. <laughs> he joins the Red Cross, not actually the war effort, but he's well, driving I mean, yeah. Yeah. ambulances sure. and delivering goods. Sure. Tossing chocolate out to kids and stuff. But this is the thing. He is free for the first time in his life. He's oh, out from gotcha, yeah. crazy bully mom. He is drinking and carousing and mom's not around. And this is awesome. July 8th, 1918, he is delivering chocolates and smokes over to the Italian soldiers hmm. and gets caught in the middle of a battle. Oh, He has leg and knee shrapnel. Oh, He saves another soldier but is heavily injured. I mean... That's a hell of a good story. He's been on the front for six days. Oh, Jesus. (laughs) Okay. Okay. He he has a great time for six days. The grizzled veteran. The grizzled veteran of six days. Correct. Okay. He lands himself in the hospital, naturally, to recoup, where he is taken care of by a woman named Agnes Von Karowski. Hmm. She's a lovely American gal. She's oh, well, about. Oh, that's funny. With that name, I would have thought, and here's your German or Dutch or Belgian. Okay, cool. No, she's an American lady, right. about 10 years older than Ernest. She is called the Angel of Milano. Cougar. No, she's kind to him and every other soldier. She's oh, okay. kind. She is a nurse. She okay, is... she's an. Okay, sorry. Sorry. Didn't mean to besmirch. Painkillers and you are funny today. I mean, it's also with the fans off. This thing is very, very warm. You're doing great. We'll cut that. You're doing great. She's kind to every soldier. She's a nurse. But Ernest, of course, thinks that all of her attention is all about him. As he's healing, they wander Milan together. He finds it all very romantic. Mm. He adores her and in a pretty creepy way. He is super intense about his feelings for her. He says it was worth getting wounded just to meet her. Is he 18? At yeah. this point, okay, so, I mean, that's kind of age-appropriate, to be honest. My feeling in regard to Agnes is she does not feel the same intensity about Ernest. He leaves uh, New Year's Eve of 1918. He's discharged and leaves to go back to Oak Park. And shortly after, Agnes sends a Dear Ernest letter. Oh. <laughs> Says, you know, we disagree and the arguments we had wore me out and here's what creeps i gave in to keep you from getting desperate red flag i gave in to keep you from getting desperate god it makes me so angry 
Uh, But the truth is, I'm just too old for you. I just can't get away from the fact that you are a boy. Crushes Ernest. I'm sure. Agnes will actually be his model for Catherine Barkley in the novel A Farewell to Arms. Okay. A few years down the road. But no matter. He has returned to Oak Park a war hero. Yeah. Again, storytelling and lies. I was a soldier. I was personally decorated by the king. Oh, my God. He turns into a local celebrity. I bet. Ernest is feeling really stifled by small town life. And Mm -hmm. his mama, Grace, kind of kicks him out. She's like, you're a lazy loafer and you're too (laughs) handsome for your own good. You need to grow the fuck up and get a job. Get out of here. Convenient. So Hemingway heads off to Chicago to write articles for the Toronto Star. Okay. Okay. So enter the first Mrs. Hemingway. Mm. Hadley Richardson. Born November 9th. She is a Scorpio. She's a water sign too. Technically on your nostrology, they should be drowning. But he's a Cancer. She's a Scorpio. This should be a classic love match. This is one of the very best sign matches. They're both highly emotional, intuitive, empathetic, possessive, loyal. They'll make each other feel more loved than in potentially any other match. Which they do for a while. Maybe Ernest forever, but we're getting to that. So let me tell you a little bit about Hadley. She is visiting Chicago from St. Louis. She is a little older. She's 29. She's about 10 years older than Hemingway. Okay. So, all right. So I'm seeing, I'm seeing the Imago. She has led a very sheltered life. She's had a protective mother. And by 29, she's dried up on the shelf. She's a spinster. She loves Ernest. Loves him in spite of the age difference. And here's Ernest. Oh, here's my Agnes Amago. Here's my older woman. Hadley is full-figured and very plain, little makeup. Like, she is just something new and different. And Ernest falls for her. She falls for him. They have five visits with each other, countless letters. And nine months later, they are married September 3rd, 1921. God, people moved so fast in those days. Well, let me tell you about Hadley. She also has a trust fund. (laughs) So it's a modest trust fund, but clearly Ernest is, you know, going to become a man. Mm -hmm. He gets a letter of entree from one of his hero writers, Sherwood Anderson. And on the 8th of December, Ernest and Hadley head across to Paris on a boat. Let's go be expats. We can live like kings there off of your modest inheritance. And be in the center of shit where it's all happening. I mean, I actually respect that choice. Well, he talks himself into getting a job as a foreign correspondent for the Toronto Star there. So he has arguably a job. But Paris in the 20th century, Gertrude Stein says Paris is where the 20th century was. And here he and Hadley come in contact with this explosion of art. And Gertrude Stein, Mm -hmm. he meets as well. Her influence really hones down his writing. Ernest has a pretty big aversion to gay people, but he's going to use Gertrude Stein as long as he is interested in using Gertrude Stein. As long as she's helpful. Correct. Gertrude, of course, about this time and the people here, she's a little older. She's the generation above this explosion happening in Paris. She says they are a lost generation famously. They drink and they're in cafes and cafes kind of is where it happens. You can, you don't have heat in your home, but you can go to a cafe and stay warm all day and drink for the price of a cup of coffee. You have a table, you have heat. Now Hadley doesn't have this. Hadley's at home taking care of home and hearth without a hearth. Mm. Uh, There's a particular time where Hadley buys a coat because it's winter in Cause, Paris. Because yeah, it's cold. And she's freezing. And he's furious. But it's her money. And he was, she was wasting her money like that, she he shops could, at that he Target. couldn't spend. Correct. Like she shot like whatever the Target equivalent Dick. in yeah, Paris yeah, is. Yeah. We're like, as a counterpart, Zelda Fitzgerald shopping at Chanel. Like she went to Goodwill and bought a fucking coat. Yeah. He's mad about it. Yeah. Anyway, he has his official address at Shakespeare and Company, becomes, yeah, 
We've been there. We have been there. <laughs> Sylvia Beach. We're going to talk about her and a little trashy tidbit coming up. He makes friends with Ezra Pound and teaches him boxing in return for like writing help. Okay. And Hadley loves him, supports him. He's writing all the time, not only for his foreign correspondent job, but for publication as well. He is over in Austria doing some reporting and Hadley's like, oh, I think I'll come to visit you. So she packages up all of his work, including his carbon copies, and gets to the train station in Paris and goes to get a water and his writing is gone when she comes back. What? She cries the whole time Whoa. to Austria. Oh and he's God. like, Hadley, you know, whatever it is, we can work it out. The thing about those manuscripts, they are forever lost. She is devastated. An earnest cancer man is never going to forgive her for this. I bet. I mean, oof. I would have a tough time, too. I'm not going to lie. Now, the flip side of this, I'm going to go ahead and talk about the universe is always conspiring in your favor, because now all of the works he's labored over for for years are gone. He, in an effort to recreate and write new work, is writing quick and fast. And here he begins to take what he's learned at the Kansas City Star right, right. and write with a speed that truly is impressive and really begins to hone his... Interesting. Yes. He heads over to 1923 to Spain and falls in love with Pamploma and bullfighting, which is a big dick energy sport over there. <laughs> Hadley is pregnant. She goes with him. And while she's watching bullfights with Ernest, she's knitting baby blankets and closing her eyes. Like, she's not a fan of this, but she, she is devoted to Ernest. And their love letters are just sweet and ten Like, it's just, Aww. this is an amazing love story. Oh, and she's about to get screwed. Their son, <laughs> who is nicknamed Bumby, is born October 1923. Sorry, did you say Bumby? Mm -hmm. His okay. name is Jack. He's got a whole big name, but okay. he's called Bumby his whole okay. life. He is fat and sweet, and Gertrude Stein is his godmother. And Ernest, by this point, has gained a little recognition he releases a book of short stories called In Our Time, and he's like, all right, you know, I, I need my breakthrough novel. But he heads on back, because he's in love with Spain and bullfighting, heads on back with a group of expatriates again to Pomploma. And this time, the trip includes a lady named Lady Duff Twisden. So, sorry. Um... Lady Duff, and he's infatuated. And she becomes the real-life inspiration for Lady Brett Ashley. Hemingway's iconic femme fatale in his debut novel, The Sun Also Rises, mm. which is not even a thinly disguised portrait of what happens on this trip. Uh-huh. Okay. In Paris, he meets F. Scott Fitzgerald. Heard of him. Yeah. Who, F. Scott, again, the Patreon app's going to tell you everything you need to know. F. Scott touts him to Scribner, his publishing house, and Maxwell Perkins, Scott's friend and editor-in-chief sends a telegram like, you need to know about my friend Ernest. He's amazing. Scribner's does buy the right to publish The Sun Also Rises, but Ernest kind of makes a clever little deal like, you can have this as long as you accept these other two works. And if you don't accept them all, we're done. And it's, it's kind of tricky. I mean, that's savvy. One of these other works is called The Torrents of Spring, which is a vicious satire of Sherwood Anderson, the guy who wrote him a letter to make mm. his entree in Paris. Sure. Ernest Hemingway, you ungrateful son of a bitch. So now that he's got a little fame, he's trying to break away from his sponsors and never really gives credit back to the people who have helped him. Right. Publishes The Sun Also Rises in October of 1926. It is a breakthrough success, but Mom... Back in Oak Park is like, nah, this is the best you can do. And he's still trying to justify himself to her. Ernest also at this point breaks apart from Gertrude. He says Gertrude is jealous of him. He has surpassed her teaching. He's learned all of he can he's learned all he can. Again, he's not grateful at all to the help and assistance of the people who bring him to the next. Yeah, he's run. like 25, 26 here. What a dick. Two things have happened. One we're going to talk to because Ernest and Hadley are about to fall out in the worst of ways. But 
Gertrude is said challenges his talent and masculinity, and she has a very famous line, a rose is a rose is a rose. I don't have a lot of love for the writing of Gertrude Stein. She's another story for another day. But in response, Ernest, in sealing the deal, sends her a telegram reading a bitch is a bitch is a bitch. Wow. Um, okay. okay. So this is all happening by 1926. But I'm going to go ahead and back you up okay. to like 1925. Because something else has happened in the meantime. Hadley found a friend. Well, that's nice. Super nice. A chic and very wealthy gal named Pauline Pfeiffer, who is in Paris as a Vogue correspondent. Cool. She is everything Hadley's not, where Hadley is kind of full-figured and very plain and no makeup, just a natural sort of woman. Pauline is flat-chested, cropped hair, wears emerald earrings. Like, she is loaded. Friday Fisher, is that who you're describing? Kind of, yeah. Her family owns a town in Arkansas loading. Oh, jeez. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Pauline grows up assuming she can have anything she wants, and she wants Ernest. And to Pauline's credit, Pauline is a very talented writer. She is a very hard worker. But this hard work ethic that she has is going to pay off for her because she sets her cap for Ernest, and the game is on. Hmm. Now, remember in Paris at this time, everyone is sleeping around with everybody else. But by all accounts, Ernest and Hadley are the happiest couple. They are faithful to each other. They're poor as dirt. But they'll eat their poorness because they're so in love. And it all starts innocently enough. Hadley gets a friend. Mm, So bad. So now I'm going to read from A.E. Hotchner. Hemingway's biography. Yep. Not Aaron Hotchner, he of Criminal Minds, although I think he may have been named for A.E. Hotchner. In about 30 years, Ernest is going to have a super bad plane wreck. Okay. And this plane crash leads him to really buddy up with Hotchner and tell his story. So his memoir, like, okay. Right. So all of this happens, this retelling happens in the 50s. So it's a very... Hotchner wrote a great book, Hemingway in Love. The link to it is on the page. So you're about to hear Hemingway's recollection of this. Hmm. Okay. So this is A. A. Hotchner talking. After this plane crash in Africa made him reassess his life, suddenly nothing seemed more vital than to re-examine those years when he let his only true love slip away. So he began telling me on tape and letters and often in long conversations of his, Jesus, harrowing experience of being in love with two women simultaneously and how Pauline had broken up the first and happiest of his marriages. Dudes are so fragile. He'd been living with Hadley and their infant son, Jack, nicknamed Bumby, above a Paris sawmill. As he struggled to make a name as a writer, they were poor but idyllically happy. I adored her looks and the feel of her in bed, Ernest said of Hadley who shared his enthusiasm for hiking, skiing, and fishing. Ernest's short stories were beginning to attract the attention of the expat crowd in Paris, including the novelist, fuck off Scott Fitzgerald. Hotchner didn't say that. I just added that in. Sure. It was 1925, and Scott Fitzgerald had recently published his masterpiece, The Great Gatsby. The two writers often met for drinks at the Ritz. Before long, Fitzgerald introduced him to his rich and decadent circle of friends which included two sisters called Pauline and Jenny Pfeiffer. After dining with Ernest just once, the Pfeiffer started descending with an alarming frequency on his modest household, Hmm. bearing gifts from a swank toy store for Bumby. Oh. Apparently, Pauline Hmm. took a liking to Hadley, inviting her to fashion shows and tea at the Crillon Hotel. Occasionally, the sisters would swoop in the shabby little room Ernest rented As his study and drag him out, they were diverting company with their witticism slang and the racy way they smoked cigarettes and ivory holders. Didn't matter, Ernest says. I wasn't interested. Life with Hadley was solid. And after a time, Ginny didn't come anymore. And Pauline came alone, looking up to the minute chic, cheerful and exuding admiration, which, of course, after a tough day felt good. I bet. I bet it did. She had a genuine or feigned affection for Bumby, 
visited him, took him to Punch and Judy shows, offered to babysit whenever Hadley and I wanted to go out. But as broke as we were, we never took her up on it since we didn't have the scratch to go anywhere. Not so subtly, Pauline began inviting the couple to expensive restaurants, knowing full well that Hadley would not leave Bumby. So Ernest went, and Pauline paid. She's loaded, right? Loaded. Jesus Christ. Ernest says she was clever and entertaining and full of desire, he recalled. She had the I-get-what-I-want hubris of a very rich girl who won't be denied. Hotchner asked Ernest, what was it like being around someone so rich when he was so poor? Ernest says, back then, to be honest, I probably liked it. Poverty is a disease that's cured by the medicine of money. I guess I like the way she spent it. Designer clothes, taxis, restaurants. Later on, when reality got to me, I saw the rich for what they were. A goddamn blight like the fungus that kills tomatoes. Pauline is making notes. It just gets worse. I don't know what to say about that. The affair starts when Pauline invites him back to her apartment one day. All too soon, Ernest says, sex with her had become kind of a narcotic. Though I hate to admit it, I became as attached to her as I was to Hadley. Ernest turns to Hotchner. You ever loved two women at the same time, he asked. Hotchner says I hadn't. Hemingway says, lucky boy. That summer, Ernest and Hadley were invited to stay in one of two adjoining villas in the south of France. Sarah and Gerald Murphy invited them. Mm -hmm. I remember them. Soon after their arrival, Bumby catches whooping cough and the family finds themselves in quarantine. Like, right. The Murphys are like, yeah, you can't get around our kids. Oh, yeah. Pre-vaccination days. Yeah. But Pauline to the rescue immediately rushes in and offers to help, saying she's immune to the disease. Ernest agrees to this. He tells Hotchner, that's my regret. I didn't tell her not to. A four-legged regret with six sharp horns. Pauline, of course, stays on even after the boy is out of danger. And during this trip, it's the only good thing F. Scott Fitzgerald's ever done. Ernest and Scott go off to a beach cafe. And Scott already knows his secret and says to Ernest, I've got eyes. The way she looks at you, hangs around, coddles Hadley, and now showing up here, you are being set up by a femme fatale. When she first arrived in Paris, word was out that she was shopping for a husband. She wants you for herself, and she'll do anything to get you. Ernest breaks down, admits he loves both women. Fitzgerald says she is going to bust up your marriage if you don't get rid of her. Hemingway's pissed. Calls Scott a sad son of a bitch. You don't know a damn thing about women. He grips Ernest's arms. Get rid of her. Now, right here, this is a three-alarm fire. Now's the time tell her. Ernest does not. That winter, he takes his family to a cheap hotel at an Austrian ski resort. Guess who shows up? I can't even imagine. Pauline books herself into the same place. Crazy. Imagine. Asks Ernest to give her skiing lessons, often just piles into bed with Hadley and Ernest in no underwear and a nightshirt like, let's all cuddle together. That's a normal thing people do, right? No, not in our marriage. No, we cuddle with their cats, with their dog. True. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it may be if that's if that's your thing. No, that's not. Have at. But I Hadley did not. I don't think that's a normal thing. Sign on for that. Right. Okay. So now this brings us up to there at this Austrian ski resort. He gets contacted by New York. Now he's got a contract for a book. So we're catching back up to. Okay. Him leaving everyone behind. He takes the train back to Paris. Who turns up? Pauline. She clung she to me like everywhere. ivy on a wall. Did she have a an airplane prior to air travel? Like no, invisible jet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He goes to New York on his way on his return from New York. Pauline meets his boat train. Ah, <sighs> he finally like gets himself out of her clutches. He gets back to the ski resort. At the station, Hadley standing there, lovely Hadley and little Bumby. At that moment, I wished I'd died before loving anyone else. His resolution is short-lived. Once they returned to Paris, he could not resist Pauline again. Pauline wants to allay suspicion about this. So Pauline invites Hadley to accompany her and Jenny 
Pauline's sister on a motor trip. That's gross. To look at a chateau. That's gross. Oh, no. She is BFF. Like, how they, she's, Pauline is writing love letters to Ernest that are, Sexy and racy, and I want you so much. Meanwhile, writing Hadley, oh, I'm your best friend. Are you mad at me? Yeah, like, so gross. What's going on? Gross. Yeah, okay. It's, pa- that's tough. No, this is so trashy. So Pauline now becomes testy and hostile with Hadley, who asks her sister Jenny, has Pauline fallen in love with Ernest? Ooh. And Jenny says nervously, I think they're very fond of each other. It was enough. Hadley finally gets it, and she understands why Pauline's been buying swank toys for Bumby and taking her to fashion shows, and Hadley confronts Ernest. She begins to cry. There's Bumby to consider. Do you think you could get over your obsession if I gave you time to sort yourself out? Like, this is healthy communication. Like, whoa, something's going on with you. Like, if you've got time to fix this, what are, like... It, yeah, yeah. Would, would that work? And Ernest says, you know, Hadley, I love you. This affair shouldn't matter. But he tells Hotchner years later, I wanted to have both of them. I didn't know much about women, did I? Nope. No, you didn't. Several months, he's still seeing Pauline. Hadley comes to a decision and says, hey, I'm going to find a separate place for Bumby and me. Ernest says he was in kind of a daze. He had been floored by a wicked left hook. His affair continues, but he sees Hadley when he comes around to spend time with his son. And one day she says like, hey, I'll give you one last chance. She gets a piece of paper and writes, quote, if Pauline Pfeiffer and Ernest Hemingway do not see each other for a hundred days, and if at the end of that time, Ernest Hemingway tells me he still loves Pauline Pfeiffer, I will, without further complication, divorce Ernest Hemingway, unquote. So she's trying to, like, dry him out and see how he feels? Is that kind of what's happening? Yeah, like, just get, like, he's, she sees, oh, Pauline. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a sharky, sharky skank. I get what's happening here. If I can just get my husband away from you and your clutches. Right. A little breathing room. Yeah, clear his head. She signs it, and Ernest says... It felt like a goddamn death warrant. And she says, it is. Either she dies or I do. Pauline takes the ultimatum well, commenting that it was a small price to pay. And she goes back to Arkansas for the 100 days. Hadley finds a new apartment. Ernest volunteers to wheel over all her possessions in a little hand cart. He cries to Hotchner later, putting all those intimate things in the cart and pushing them down the street got to me. I cried all the way there. Drinking ratcheted up my anguish, that and the daily letters from Pauline and her wild yearning for me. One of the few people Ernest sees during this time is fuck off Scott Fitzgerald. Right. Who tells him, I warned you. Told you. Yeah. She'd probably bring you some positive things, buddy, but she'd also bring you remorse. Don't try living with remorse. Remorse will break your goddamn heart. Which it does. Hotchner, again, asked Hemingway years later, how did the two women differ in bed? Night and day, Ernest admitted. Hadley submissive, willing, a follower, sweet climax. Pauline explosive, wildly demonstrative. In charge, mounts me, climaxes like a thunderstorm. They're opposites. Me in charge of Hadley, Pauline in charge of me. Scott said the key, the key thing was that Ernest should be in charge of himself. Besides the sex, Pauline is tons of money, servants, fancy apartments, restaurants, first-class safaris, your own boat. Ernest protests he doesn't give a damn about any of that. And Scott's like, but you do, him. You'll live like I live, something you covet. You'd like to have a regular table at the Ritz, a top-level safaris, you're tired of poverty. Poverty is grinding and it's worn you down. Scott still warns him. You need the shining qualities of Hadley, her buoyancy. Neither Pauline nor her money can provide that. During those hundred days, Ernest says there were times he wanted to kill himself. After 75 days, Hadley's like, fuck this. I am no longer prepared to wait and you can have your damn divorce. Good for her. Um, Yeah, he, I'm sorry, but it, this... 
there are all sorts of sexist tropes about women being too emotional, et cetera. And it just sounds like that is Ernest Hemingway. I'm sorry. Like, Oh, it gets worse. These things are applied to women unfairly because it is often men. Who... Yep. Ernest feels numb. He recalls, I suppose that down deep I had been unrealistically hoping that when the hundred days were up, Hadley would go along with my desire to keep both of them in my life. He gets this letter from Hadley after 75 days. On day 76, he writes Hadley, day after, says, All the royalties from the sun also rises would go to you. You are the best and loveliest person I've ever known. Hadley ends it writing to him, Eat well, sleep well, keep well, and work well. Ernest writes back to Hadley, It's the luckiest thing that Bumby has you for a mother. You are the best, the truest, and loveliest person. I have ever known. They divorce April the 4th, 1926. Hadley stays in France until 1934. And one of her friends, after she ditches that other yeah, skanky that snake friend, other Pauline, friend, yeah. one of her friends is a gentleman named Paul Mower. He was a foreign correspondent for the Chicago Daily News. They met back in the spring of 1927, not long after her divorce was finalized. Mower won a Pulitzer Prize in 1929. Like he's a super good writer. After five years of dating, July 3rd, 1933, they marry in London. And Hadley's especially grateful for his warm relationship with her son, Bumby. They move back to a suburb of Chicago. They lived there during World War II. She continued to receive royalties from The Sun Also Rises, including the royalties from the 1957 film. Cool. They were married very happily until his death in 1971. Wow, that's a long marriage. Yeah. yeah. No, they're, they're, she Good for them. Perfectly wonderful for yeah. them that she found a love that would love her. I do have just a little bit more update on what happens after this. So once Hadley divorces Hemingway, she leaves the limelight, does settle down, lives a very wonderful life with her husband. And they reportedly only saw each other twice after their divorce. The first time in July of 1939, she and her new husband ran into him while vacationing in Wyoming. And he, Ernest is still writing Hadley letters. You're the best wife of, like, you're the most wonderful, you're the loveliest. And she ends up writing back to Ernest, like, hey, these letters are making my husband upset. Yeah, knock this off. You gotta stop this. Has he... Like, what's the deal with their son? Does he not see his son or? They what? do. Okay. Yeah. He still has kind of a relationship with Bumby. They're, okay. He's about to have a lot more kids. So hang tight. According to Hotchner, they see each other one more time in a brief and spontaneous meeting in Paris. One day in Paris, Ernest meets Hadley again by pure chance and says, I, I'll spend the rest of my life looking for you. She was just getting out of a taxi when he spotted her, as beautiful as I remembered her. As he approached, she gasped and threw her arms around him. A few minutes later, she was sipping champagne with him in a restaurant. I'll always love you, he told her. She raised her glass, touched his, and she said she had to go. As they waited on the corner for the traffic lights to change, he told her, I want you to know, Hadley, you'll be the true part of any woman I write about. I'll spend the rest of my life looking for you. And when the lights changed to green, Hadley kissed him goodbye, and he watched her cross the street and never saw her again. Is it possible he invented that scene? No, it's documented. They it, really did see each other and... Had a friendly yeah, whisk, glass of champagne, a little chit-chat. Each other and... finally. No, he's never going to get over her. He is writing about her and his typewriter the day he shoots himself like he he never gets over her hadley dies january 22nd in 1979 in lakeland florida seven years after her husband she dies at the age of 87 after a very successful second marriage successful motherhood and a life away from the first husband and your best friend who broke your heart. Yeah. Because Pauline, like, can you imagine? 
It's your best friend. It's, uh... And Pauline wants to fuck Ernest, but she wants Hadley's absolution and permission at the same time. It's Shania Twain, Mutt Lang, and God, all that. it's all creeps. It is all creeps. There are a lot of templates. So, let's take a little break. Let's take a little break. When we come back, we're going to talk about his next three wives. Yikes. And dip on back to Pauline and talk about some instant karma. Okay. But now it's time for a word from our commercial sponsor. Look, our stories can get into some pretty extreme conflicts, but the truth is everybody struggles sometimes. Having an impartial counselor to talk to can give you a safe and confidential space to level set and work through the stuff keeping you up at night. Here's the great news. Wherever you are, BetterHelp can connect you with a professional counselor online. So you can get help via secure video or phone sessions. You can chat or text with your therapist. The best part, you can start communicating with your therapist in under 24 hours. You can use your desktop computer, mobile web, Android, and iOS apps. It's never been easier to find a therapist who specializes in the issues important to you, including, oh, it's a good list, family conflict, LGBT matters, stress, depression, trauma, relationships, self-esteem, and anxiety. And even better, if you're not vibing with your BetterHelp counselor, just request a new one at no additional charge. Hey, coolest of all, y'all. As a Trashy Divorces listener, you can get 10% off your first month by visiting our special URL at BetterHelp.com slash Trashy. Trashy. Once you're there, fill out a quick questionnaire so BetterHelp can match you with a great counselor. Just visit BetterHelp.com slash Trashy for 10% off your first month. Go get yourself some self-care. You don't even need to put on a bra to do it, y'all. You can just do it from your computer. Braless. We support that. We do support that. All right. So uh, you've what's been, next? You've been documenting a very selfish guy for a couple days now. So I can't wait to hear more of this trash baggery. I make no secret of the fact that Hadley is my favorite wife. There's a wonderful book that we're going to link to called The Paris Wife by Paula McLean. Excellent book on Hadley if you really want to get her voice and exactly how tragic the story all is. But let's go ahead and talk about Pauline Pfeiffer. Okay. We have a little bit. Mm -hmm. She was born July 22nd, day after Ernest, but she's the first day of Leo. Right. All right. So he is ruled. She's a fire sign. Fire and his water are going to make steam. Okay. Cancer and Leo kind of make an interesting couple because... Leo is ruled by the sun. Cancer is ruled by the moon. It's a very... Cancer's and Leo's not really that much, but Pauline has bossed him around as far as this point, so why not do it some more? Sure. I'm going to go ahead and read again from A.E. Hotchner. Pauline, after the Hadley divorce, is predictably triumphant. Though marriage had never been discussed, she goes ahead and books a fashionable church for their wedding. Orders a gold embossed uh, wedding invitations from Cartier. Pauline is having a dress designed for her by Lanvin with a strand of Cartier pearls. Ah, it's all bad. Ernest drifts along with these plans, but is deeply disturbed when his divorce becomes final. He has to get an annulment from Hadley because Pauline is super, super Catholic, so... To Ernest's dismay, he finds himself unable to perform in bed. Wow. Pauline uh, says maybe it's her fault being so busy with wedding plans and not doing enough for me. We got into bed. She'd asked if I'd seen a doctor. I said I had. I'd also tried all kinds of inducements, such as Spanish fly, Chinese potions, a variety of pills, electrodes fastened to my testicles. She had one suggestion. He should get down on his knees in church and pray. Ernest is like, I'm not religious. I'd feel kind of foolish getting down on my knees and asking Jesus to give me an erection. But he said he'd give it a try. So they walk to the nearest Catholic church where he kneels self-consciously in front of a statue and makes his request to Jesus. And Jesus delivers his request. Goes back to the apartment. Pauline's waiting in bed. She rolled on top of me, and we had as good of a session as we ever had. 
she also finds them a grand new flat. So where he has lived in a hovel on the fifth floor with Hadley. With no heat. Now he is in a grand seven-room apartment off the Luxembourg Gardens, all paid for by Pauline's rich uncle, who give the couple a car. And also as a wedding gift, a nice little house in Key West, Florida, a fishing boat, and a deluxe African safari. Wow. So just like Scott had... Fitzgerald had Mm -hmm. predicted Ernest has indeed joined the rich set. Yep. There's a slight hiccup on their honeymoon when they do marry May 10th, 1927. Okay, so they waste no time. Yeah, they waste no time. A a, a year. But you have to wait for the annulment to come through. Come on. And line up all your boats and homes and make sure you're going to be... Pauline has a lot more money than Hadley ever did in her little tiny trust. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But they get married May of 1927, and on their honeymoon, Ernest becomes impotent again. His bride is happy, though. Whatever I did or didn't do was all right with her. She'd gone through hell to get me, and she treated me like a prize. It doesn't sound like she went through hell to get him. It sounds like they had an affair all over the capitals of Europe, and then his wife left him. (laughs) Pretty much. (laughs) So he and Pauline do marry. I'll talk about Key West in a second, but I'm just going to bring this back in. Ernest's gloom intensifies when Scott Fitzgerald writes him in 1933 with the news that Hadley had remarried. My fantasy was that she would still be single, as it seemed more and more likely, I would leave Pauline and return to her in Bumby. You dick. I am not even kidding about what a dick this guy is. Ever since the divorce, he, again, had been writing to tell Hadley how much he loved her. Hadley, again, writes back, like, you got to stop this. This upsets my husband. Yeah. It should also upset his wife because he's married to Pauline now. Yeah. I'm guessing she doesn't know that these letters are being sent. I don't know. Like. Probably not. But Pauline, like, instant karma's going to get you. You're, it's not going to work out for you great either, sweetheart. But the uncle lands a sweet deal on a home for them in Key West at 907 Whitehead Street, right across from the Key West Lighthouse. Originally purchased, you ready for this, from auction for $8,000. I'm so mad. We've I'm been to that house. So we have. And $8,000. So mad. In the early 30s, late 20s. So the house, let me just give you a little bit, because if you ever get a chance to go to Key West, y'all, go to the Hemingway house. Be sure to hit the Six-Toed Cat Cafe next door. But I really feel like this is kind of cool. The house stands at an elevation of 16 feet above sea level. It is the second highest site on the island. It was originally built in 1851 by Asa Tift, who was a marine architect and salvage wrecker in the French colonial style. As a testament to its construction and location, it has survived many hurricanes. The deep basement has remained completely dry in that home. Wow. Before Hurricane Irma struck the Keys in September 2017, the entire population of the Keys is ordered to evacuate. And the museum's curator says, nope, I'm not going to leave this house or evacuate the cats. So several of the Hemingway home employees stayed there with the cats. They all survived the storm intact. This was Hemingway's home, Pauline's home and Hemingway's home from 1931 to 1939. And even though they will divorce in 1940, he retains the title to that home until he dies. In November of 1968, it was designated a U.S. National Historic Landmark. But initially... He and Pauline are very much drawn to Key West for the climate and the fishing. Oh, Prohibition is laughable down in Key West. I bet. I bet. He starts hanging out with his friend Joe Russell, who has opened a bar called Sloppy Joe's, which was the original Captain Tony's. I've got a lot of fun stuff here. Maybe we'll trashy tidbit that. He's drinking at Sloppy Joe's every day, doing fishing. And this is kind of fun. Ernest actually converts a urinal obtained after a renovation at Sloppy Joe's into a water fountain for the yard in his home, where it remains a prominent feature filled with water 
for the cats. Sure. <laughs> sure. But he and Joe Russell are having a great time. They're smuggling rum, chasing Marlin, and he builds his own boat, the Pilar. And in Key West, he has found his paradise. He is the champion of fishing. In 1935, he wins. He has caught the biggest sailfish in the Atlantic up to that time. Wow. His method for fishing is muscle and endurance. In the spring of 1935, two tuna that weigh 514 pounds and 610 pounds. Wait. Yeah. 514 pounds, 610 pounds. Oh, my God. How? The, how? I, like, the... Wow. Big dick energy. Okay. So, these are the first two big unmutilated tuna ever taken in Bimini. His style became so acclaimed that if anyone brought in a fish using his approach, it was said to have been Hemingway. <laughs> well, and there is that bar down there with the giant giant fish face on its wall captain tony's or sloppy joe's so he's drinking at sloppy joe's every day still doing his thing with pauline i guess we should get back to her he is writing a farewell to arms and by uh, i don't know it it goes pretty bad so pauline is happy she has two kids patrick and gregory but pauline wasn't ever really meant to be a mom she didn't like being around kids. <laughs> and even her boys have a difficult relationship with her. Interesting. In 1935. She really is Hadley's opposite then. Uh, Just 100%. Entirely the antithesis of Hadley. In 1935, Ernest writes about Pauline as a willing and supportive, loving wife in the Green Hills of Africa. But by 1936, she is characterized as a manipula manipula manipulative. I can't even talk today. A, and a shrew in the snows of Kilimanjaro. What tipped him off? Well, here's the thing: Catholic, and she doesn't believe in birth control. And her doctor warns her against getting pregnant again. So it effectively ends their sexual relationship. Ernest is pretty much over it. The Relationship is pretty much over, and Ernest is like, hey, that's not going to stop me. So he has been carrying on this affair with this lady named Jane Mason for a number of years. Of course he has. She fills a void left by Pauline. This poor girl is a little skewed anyway, and she throws herself out a second-story window, breaks her back. Ernest says, she's the girl who fell for me. Nope. No. Can't make it up. No, they break. Nope. He and Jane Mason break up in the summer of 1936. And he's still married to oh, Pauline. Yeah. Okay. They're going to be married till 1940. Okay. Uh, cool. cool. But cool. he is frantic to escape domesticity and babies. And he heads off to Cuba. So the girl who fell for him, uh, he tells Pauline all about her. He even when he's in Cuba romancing her before they break it off in the summer Sends Pauline a picture of her. Pauline is like, okay, I'm not going to give up. To compete with her rival, she tells Ernest she's seeing a plastic surgeon so she can have some surgeries. She says by then she knew he wanted a divorce. He says as a couple, we'd gone flat. Being together was boring. We weren't connected. Nothing much to talk about. She used her wealth to connect us, but it just put me off. Their marriage is over. This is 1936. Again, they're going to stay married a few more years because there's no really reason to get divorced yet. And she has money. I mean. Because da, da, da. At Sloppy Joe's one day, in walks a beautiful young reporter named Martha Gellhorn. Mm. She's on a vacation with her family there. And we'll talk about it in a second. Okay, Martha Gellhorn. Born November 8th. She's a Scorpio too. One day off from Hadley. Good Lord. Good Lord. But the Cancer Scorpio mix. Martha, in no time at all, has pulled a Pauline and has moved into the Hemingway home with Ernest and Pauline. Yep. How, how does Pauline respond to... I think Pauline says instant karma's gonna get ya. Uh, Martha says she feels like a fixture in their Key West home. 
And in 1936, she and Ernest, Martha and Ernest, decide to leave together for Spain to cover the Spanish Civil War. Oh, yeah. That's so we're going to yeah. come back to Martha in just a second, but let's talk about the rest of Pauline. Pauline and Ernest do divorce the 4th of November, 1940. Pauline spends the rest of her life in Key West with frequent visits to California. She dies October 1st, 1951 at the age of 56. Her death is attributed to an acute state of shock related to her son Gregory's arrest and a subsequent phone call from Ernest. So there are two stories. Gregory and Hemingway's little bio says, I was arrested for marijuana and, you know, my dad called my mom and she had an aneurysm and the shock of it was so great. Other accounts report that Gregory, who had experienced gender identity issues for most of his life, had been arrested, caught entering a women's bathroom in a movie theater. He becomes a medical doctor, interprets his mother's. He's trying to abdicate himself from feeling like I killed my mother. Right, right. His theory that the phone call from Ernest had caused her tumor on her adrenal gland to secrete excessive adrenaline, change in blood pressure causes her death. But Pauline does die in 1951, never remarries. It's a sad end for Pauline. Agreed. Let's go ahead and pick up on soon-to-be wife number three. Okay. Martha Gellhorn. Martha Gellhorn, Scorpio okay. 2. Now, keep in mind that Ernest and Pauline divorced the 4th of November. Ernest waits all of 15 days to marry Martha Gellhorn. Okay, because... Rupert Murdoch and Wendy Dang. Now, for real, Martha has grown up in St. Louis. She attends college for a little bit, but she ditches college. She's ready to write. She's not going to stick around for the degree. Arguably, she is the best war correspondent that has ever been. Her passion is war and writing on the record about war and injustice. She, Martha Gellhorn, is a total badass, and I love her. Tell me more. They, again, met at Sloppy Joe's. They go off to cover, correspondent-wise, the Spanish Civil War together. Gellhorn had been hired to report for Collier's Weekly. They're celebrating Christmas in Barcelona together in 1937. She is reporting on the rise of Adolf Hitler. They are inevitably in love, but they have to wait for that whole divorce to come through. In 1939, like a year before the divorce, they move to Cuba together. He wants to finish his novel, For Whom the Bell Tolls. They buy a place called Finca Viglia. It's the lookout farm. It's high on top of a hill outside Havana, Cuba. Okay. Oh, it's got a view of the yeah. capital and the sea. It's not unlike Key West. He can fish like a champ. And he loves the passion and the colors of Cuba. Martha finds the house because she kind of wants to move to the country because there are less temptations in yeah, the country for, than for downtown Havana. Dear, sweet, loyal Ernest. They marry. And during hurricane season, they head up to Sun Valley, Idaho. They're living the life. He's friends with Gary Cooper and Marlena Daytrick, Ingrid Bergman, Errol Flynn. Back in Cuba, he's hanging out with Wallace Simpson and Spencer Tracy at the Floridita. And he is drink. He's always been a drinker. Right. And he's known as he can hold his liquor, meaning he can drink all day and never show it. But he's on top of his game in Cuba. He writes For Whom the Bell Tolls, Fishing Nightlife. His transformation into Papa Hemingway is now happening. But World War II breaks out. And Martha's like, hey, I got a war to write about, an injustice to write about. So she takes off to be a correspondent. She's putting her career before marriage. Ernest is uh, taken aback, pretty pissed. How dare you? He wants to leave and go kick her ass good. She needs to stay home or go to military school. Yeah. Yes. Okay. He, Red Cross ambulance dude with shrapnel. He's allowed to do it, but she's like, yeah. she's just as fierce and fearless as he is. And I don't think he's ever encountered right. a woman quite like this. Over in Europe, she is reporting from Finland, Hong Kong, Burma, Singapore, England. She lacks official 
press credentials to witness the Normandy landings, but she gets there anyway. She's the only woman to land at Normandy on D-Day, June 6th, 1944. That's amazing. She's reporting it. He's angry. <laughs> She's also one of the first journalists to report from the Dachau concentration camp wow. after it was liberated. Wow. I know. She's an entire badass. A badass, yeah. So Ernest at the time like wants to stay in Cuba and ride it out. Okay, this is what he does. He decides to convert his fishing boat, the Pilar, to search for German submarines off the coast, which is really just an excuse to get the government to pay for sanctioned gas money for his fishing. Uh Uh-huh. Yep, yep, yep. J. Edgar Hoover has a file on Ernest Hemingway. He's got bad judgment and sobriety issues. And I I like that it's sobriety issues and not drinking issues. Right. Martha's like, what the fuck's wrong with you? Why are you wasting your time here in Cuba? He ends up leaving to go to London to be a correspondent for Collier's as well. He's competing with Martha. (laughs) He joins the Royal Air Force on bombing missions and is like, I can live like a young man again. And reporting is only really an excuse for throwing himself back into the, I want to see battle again. Right. My virility, bring it to me. Oh, he takes off his reporter badge and goes and fights with the troops, which after the liberation, he's drinking at the Ritz with all of his friends, but he actually is charged with kind of war crimes. Like he shouldn't be fighting, but fears a stranger to him. And he's like, I can't help. If you have a boat, you're automatically called the captain. I can't help my men think I'm. Oh, my God. I know. Eventually, he's cleared of all charges. This guy. And awarded a bronze star. Oh, my God. (laughs) I can't even. Okay. But here's the deal. Martha's reporting is far superior than his. And he is jealous and he is mad about it. Uh, He can't compete. She is the only wife who leaves him instead of the other way around. They have lived together for four years They marry in 1940. By 1943, Hemingway's writing to her, are you a war correspondent or my wife in my bed? Oh, my God. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. It's all bad. After four years of... Of that? Yeah. Well, yeah. Kind of a... She a little over? She had found, as his other wives had, and this is described by Bernice Kent in the Hemingway Women... Hemingway could never sustain a long-lived, wholly satisfying relationship with any one of his four wives. Married domesticity may have seemed to him the desirable culmination of romantic love, but sooner or later he became bored and restless, critical and bullying. They divorced in 1945. Now here's the thing. I'm going to go ahead and Lizzo it here. Jerome, take your ass home. Yeah. Because that's what Martha Gellhorn does to him. Because she has a long and illustrious career, like sure. great, the greatest war correspondent that's ever been. But famously, in every interview from this point on, you are not allowed to ask about Ernest. Zilch, nada, zip. I don't want to hear about him. I'm not going to answer a question about him. Well, and she probably didn't want to be in his shadow. Like, she is her own professional, you know, high achiever. Like, why, why be... The wife of Ernest Hemingway. Well, or the ex wife. She remarks that she had no intention of being a footnote in someone else's life. Boom. Good for you, Martha. Good for you. In order to get an interview with her, you had to promise not to mention his name. I've been a writer for over 40 years. I was a writer before I met him. I was a writer after I left him. Why should I be a footnote in his life? Yeah, that's solid. That is super solid. Take your ass home, Jerome. Martha Gellhorn does. Lead a very long life. She adopts a son, has numerous love affairs. In her last years, she was in very frail health, nearing blind, suffering from ovarian cancer. It had spread to her liver. In 1998, on February 15, she commits suicide by swallowing a cyanide capsule and sort of takes herself out in a way that she finds appropriate. The Martha Gellhorn Prize for Journalism was established in 1999 in her honor. Cool. Sort of. I mean... She had a long and wonderful life. Her writing on war and injustice really did define the 21st century of what a war correspondent was. Fucking badass. Mm -hmm. Next to Hat... Like, again, 
Martha's the total antithesis of Pauline, both writers, but Pauline leaves her writing to become a wife and become a mother and not very great at it. And there's Martha, not going to let being your wife hold me back. I was the one with a knapsack and 50 bucks to go over and report across the country, across the globe on the war. Fuck off, dude. I don't need you anyway, Ernest Hemingway. Yeah. All right. But Ernest isn't done. (sighs) Because before the divorce from Martha Gellhorn happens. Oh, my God. He is seeing a little lady named Mary Welsh. Hmm. She is the last of his wives. Uh. She is born April 5th. She is an Aries. She's a fire sign, too. Again, steam. Right. Well, he just va- he just goes back and forth, huh? You think that this is one of the most opposite pairings of the zodiac, but Aries and Cancer can be surprisingly wonderful to each other. Once they understand and accept the other for who they are, their friendship can only get better with time. So, Martha and Ernest have divorced December twenty first, nineteen forty five. Okay, he's already seeing Mary. Uh, at least he has the nerve to wait three months this time. Mm-hmm. And they marry March 14th, 1946. Okay. Mary is a writer as well. And they have met during the war. She was a correspondent as well. Antithesis of Martha, because she understands, at least for Ernest, her role as his wife. And he is the master. I'm never in competition with him. She's very small and petite. He is not. She's determined to be the final Mrs. Hemingway, and no matter what it takes. There's some violent arguments. There's a legend, uh, legendary event that happens in Paris where they get in a fight, and he takes a gun and aims it at her and shoots the toilet. She's drinking a lot. Well, I'm sure he was, too. He He's drinking a lot, too. He's writing, because, again, his writing never... Like, he's still writing, but he's writing stuff that's not... Really fit to, he doesn't think fit to be published. In the early 50s, a series of tragedies. So we're going to go back to his son arrested for marijuana or cross-dressing. Pauline is dead. He's disconnected from that son. Max Perkins dies, his editor, his editor and friend of many years. Charles Scribner dies. Wow. He's got high blood pressure, weight problems. He goes back to Europe again as a hero with Mary. But of course, because he always has a wife and a side hustle, he develops this romantic interest in an Italian princess, writes a book about her, which is the first book he's ever written that's badly received. Sure. Yeah. I, I'm not familiar, I think, with uh, that plot line. Yeah. What's the, what's the book called? After the Hills and Through the Woods. Okay, no, I don't no. know. It's not one of his best known. Right. So he's sort of down and out. He is going to get back up. He's a boxer. He's going to get back up from that canvas and begins to write The Old Man in the Sea, based loosely on Gregorio Fuentes, the captain of his Pilar. Okay. And he's a champ again. He wins the Pulitzer Prize in 1953. Okay, that's good. But in 1954, he's in not one but two plane crashes. Hey, if you walk away, you won. Well, the first one wasn't as bad as the second one. The second one... He is head injury, left with internal bleeding. Ooh. He's ruptured everything. He has a fractured skull. Okay, like so he is. He doesn't really walk away from this. No. One. Oh, yeah. He returns to Cuba to heal to Finca Vicula with Mary. And in 1954, he actually wins the Nobel Prize for Literature. He says, I won the Swedish thing. <laughs> he cannot accept in person. He's way too ill and injured. Sure. Things are not. Great, but he and Mary are still living in his home in Cuba. And they stay there for a while. Uh, Here's something, a little little fun fact for you. Ava Gardner visits and swims naked in his pool. His friend Gary Cooper. Uh, It's Papa's hideaway. But it turns out Ernest Hemingway, for as much of a weirdo as he is, is highly superstitious. So all around the home, there are these tokens and rocks, like gree-gree, all around. Rabbit's feet. One super fun thing that happens, For Whom the Bell Tolls inspires a young Cuban Fidel Castro Hmm. to revolution. Oh, boy. For Whom the Bell Tolls gives Fidel Castro the idea for how to arm the guerrillas to overthrow Batista. So it, like, lays out the blueprint. Pretty much. Great. Good job, Ernest. 
They only meet one time in a fishing competition, Ernest and Fidel, but really? Fidel wins it. <laughs> oh. And again, Ernest is in love with the Cuban people. He feels like he's going to be safe in Cuba. When he wins the Nobel Prize, he dedicates the medal to the Cuban people. Yeah, but I, I, I know what happened to Americans in Cuba. Who, right. Yeah, okay. So he's supporting the revolution, and his buddy Fidel Castro is like, I'm not going to seize your home. You gave me this great idea of how to revolutionize. It's cool. But it's kind of a tense and dangerous time. Mm-hmm. And the American embassy is like, you need to get the fuck out yeah, of here, you buddy. Need to get the fuck out of there, buddy. So he leaves Finca Vicula in July of 1960. Doesn't take a thing. The table is still set. All of his papers, all of the photos under his desk. So they, he left fast. He left fast thinking he's going to be right back. He never returns. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But this home has stayed closed up and immaculate for a number of years. Got something kind of fun for this. I can take it down. When he leaves Finca Vicula in 1960, it's perfectly intact. Like he is going to return. He never does. His boat, the Pilar, is there. George W. Bush broke the Cuban embargo into providing help to preserve Finca Vicula. Really? Yes. So all of like the, all of his... In, so, like, in the 2000s, we yeah. worked with the Cuban government to... It, his entire mass of writings are, have been molding away wow. in Cuba. And this place is all open. You can't go inside of it, but tens of thousands of people each year walk by. All the windows are open, the doors are open, and everything is exactly the way they left it. Wow. It is incredible. I've never heard of this, even. Yeah. That's... Wow. Okay. It's. It, I'll show you a video. It's really kind of... It's kind of neat. Cool. So... Leaving in 1960, Ernest with Mary returns to Ketchum, Idaho, and he's working on a movable feast, which will be the last of his writings. He ends up finding two small trunks that he had left somewhere when he moved to Key West in 1928. And this is a difficult time for Mary, who's drinking more and more. Like one of her friends even like has an intervention with her. And Mary sits and listens And at the end of sitting and listening, she goes to the kitchen, takes out a bottle of Tangeray and says, hey, I've listened to everything you said, opens the bottle of Tangeray and drinks the whole thing. Okay, so it's difficult for Mary. Ernest is writing a movable feast, revisiting all of these memories. He dedicates this book to Hadley and how much he regretted how it ended. He's never really loved another woman. His health, which was already pretty crap from plane crashes is rapidly going downhill. So after all of that nonsense, ruptured internal, I'm broken, Mm -hmm. he shoots himself in the foot shark hunting. A skylight falls on his head. He is injured by a lion when he tries to beat a lion up. I don't know. He gets skin cancer. Like Papa Hemingway is indestructible no more. He has diabetes, hepatitis, anemia, high blood pressure. And his mental health status is increasingly becoming into question. I I would think any one of those in the 1950s, 1960s would lead you to feel pretty crappy all the time and really affect your mental health. Okay, so add on to that, he's still drinking a quart of whiskey a day. Woo! Woo! Um, So his alcoholism really isn't helping anything. And of course, he listens to no doctor's advice to quit drinking. Well, he's like three centuries too late because, you know... Very recently, gin was the cure for everything. Oh, it's so bad. By like nineteen, like nineteen sixty, after he comes home, yeah. he's just into madness. He's paranoid. The FBI is investigating me. He drives by with Hotchner and sees a light on at the bank, and there's the cleaning lady, and he's like, "Oh, they're they're looking at my accounts." Oh, and he is paranoid and freaking out. Mary's suffering from alcoholism. Ernest is suffering from everything. And in 1960, they get they get Ernest to the Mayo Clinic for mental treatment. But the public thinks it's hypertension, right. high, high blood pressure. Mary's very concerned that his reputation not be damaged. Right. During this time, Ernest is given electroshock therapy, which he never wanted because he's seen it happen. As, I mean, I can't prove this anywhere, but... He certainly doesn't want that because he promoted it for Zelda Fitzgerald and look how she turned out. Like, I hate him so much. In January 
1961, John F. Kennedy asks Ernest to write a tribute for his inauguration. It takes Ernest one week to write a paragraph. His uh, the yeah. toolbox that he has for writing is done. Yeah. He is now a paranoid schizophrenic with a lot of access to guns. Mary has talked him out of some previous attempts at suicide. He heads back on over to the Mayo Clinic. During this time, they had to do a stopover. And Ernest tries to walk himself into a propeller of a plane. His friends are like, get him to the Mayo and do not let him come back home. Mary does. Takes him back. Three days later, he is dead of a gunshot wound, uh, July 2nd, 1961, at the age of 61. Yep. Yep. So, let's see. Good Lord. A. E. Hotchner. The last time I saw Ernest in 1961 when he was being treated in hospital for depression and paranoia, he was still thinking of his lost love, Hadley. It was just two weeks before he committed suicide by shooting himself. In a soft, barely audible voice, he said, Tell me this. How does a young man know when he falls in love for the very first time? How can he know that it will be the only true love of his life? How can he possibly know? He looked at me intently as if searching for an answer. Then he told me he was going to have a sleep. With any luck, he says, maybe I'll dream of Paris. Jackie Kennedy reaches out to Mary, his widow. Like, my husband is a big fan. Would you consider donating his stuff to the Kennedy Library? We'll make a special room for you. Much of that stuff is housed in the Ernest Hemingway collection. Still there today. Cool. And Mary, no divorce. I can, she lived and died a number of years later and was the very last Mrs. Hemingway. I mean, did she ever stop drinking or do you know? I don't think so. Okay. Hmm. So can I tell you, there was a a really incredible Rolling Stone article probably in the last month or two uh, about the suicide epidemic in like the Mountain West Mm -hmm. among like middle-aged white men. And... They reference Hemingway a lot. Like, he's the... Because that's what happened to him. He's the archetype, yeah. Yes. It's a very good piece that should be read to the end because, wow, it takes a turn there. Okay. I'll check it out. How to take a deep breath. Yeah. Those were the trashy divorces of... The four wives of Hemingway the Eighth. <laughs> it's about the truth. <laughs> it's about the truth. I don't even know how to gauge trash cans on this i mean arguably let's talk about Ernest and hadley she's my favorite wife if you want to really really cry there's a link we'll post uh mary chapin carpenter writes a beautiful song about hadley called mrs hemingway that i can just think about now and want to start crying about it's beautiful that's five garbage cans and fucked by your best friend at the same time yeah i mean he just seems like at the bottom just such a sad sack he's lousy to women and like you hear men talk about him oh we were great friends if Hemingway was going to hang out with you that day you were going to have the best day of your life but he's horrible to his wives I don't know I five trash cans for he and Hadley I, I'm going to give five trash cans to Pauline too like, I, yeah mm-hmm. and just Pauline by herself no I, yeah I got that and he and Pauline's divorce. Martha, I'm going less because Martha, Jerome, take your ass home. Yep. Like, yeah, I have a lot of respect for her. No, it sounds like he was really trash baggy and she was like, wow, you're a trash bag and left. I'm done with your masculinity. You can't push me around. Mm-hmm. This isn't what I'm about. I had a whole life before you. I'm going to have a whole life after you. And I'm better than this. So minimal trash cans. Yeah. Two. I sure. mean, She fucked around on him. He was fucking around on her. There's some shit there, but good for you claiming your independence, Martha. And God, those are the trashy divorces of Ernest Hemingway. Can he get 614 pounds of trash bag tuna? Just leave it in the sun for a while to rot a little, then bag it up. I mean, again, no diminishment upon his talent as a writer, but you really treated some people lousy in your life. And you see it happen over and over again. 
Be sure to go check out that Patreon app with Zelda and Scott and Ernest because my ire for him really was developed in in in, in my love and admiration for Zelda Sayer. Which he, he did not share your love and admiration for Zelda Sayer. She didn't share it for him either. Bullfighting, bullslinging, and bullshit. She's, he's bogus. And she saw through him. You guys check it out. It's a great little accompaniment to this episode. Mm-hmm. Totally free on Patreon. Cool. And that wraps us up for Does another wrap week. Us up? I'm so sorry I could not contribute more than my yes and ums and utterances. Hey, it's cool. It got to be Podcast Alicia this week. And I got to tell the trashiest story that I've wanted to tell for the longest time. I mean, that is sort of an upside. Like, obviously, I'm in a decent amount of pain right now. But I'm happy that this mishap gave you the opportunity to tell this particular story because I know you've wanted to. And on Ernest Hemingway's birthday. And on Ernest Hemingway's birthday. What a. It's like the cats planned this for me. God and bless you. you. God <laughs> bless those rotten cats. Anyway, y'all, I encourage you to stay single. And if you can't, live like Martha Gellhorn. Put some Lizzo in your life. Don't fall backwards downstairs. And keep it trashy. Keep it trashy. Keep your slippers on. We'll see you next week. Bye, y'all. Big cheers. Bye. Trashy Divorces is written and produced by us, Stacy and Alicia, for Hemlock Creatives. You can contact us at TrashyDivorces at gmail.com. Our art is by Sydney V. Smith, and you can find more from her at SydneyVSmith at CarbonMade.com. And our music is used with permission of Ratsy. You can find out more about Ratsy at Ratsy's store on Instagram. Want to check out our sources, soundtracks, or other notable episode information? Visit TrashyDivorces.com. On the web, you can enjoy early ad-free releases, regular bonus stories, follow-ups, and more by joining us at patreon.com slash trashy divorces we have merchandise available online too get your trashy divorces gear at bit.ly slash trashy merch and thanks to what a maneuver for doing such a great job with our cloths hey we appreciate all of your ratings and reviews if you do leave us a five-star review on itunes send us a little picture of it let us know and we'll ship you some trashy divorces stickers and such anywhere in the world we got you because holy cat y'all we're now in 125 countries 125 countries and counting thank you for listening thank you for telling your friends thanks for being awesome you can send those emails for your free sticker swag to trashy divorces at gmail.com and last but not least check us out on social we're at Trashy Divorces at Instagram, which Alicia mostly runs, Twitter, which I, Stacy, mostly run, and on Facebook, which we pretty much split. We also have a Trashy Divorces discussion group on Facebook if you want to chat with other Trashy Divorces listeners. Thanks again, everybody, for listening. Keep, Keep it, it trashy. trashy.